Hey everybody, welcome to the Maelstrom's Edge video rulebook. This is a series of videos, each one thoroughly covering a different section of the rules. In other words, it's a way to learn the rulebook without having to read through it. As you can see, we've set up a small example game in progress here, with the Aperion Foundation forces over here on the left, facing off against the Karist Enclave on the right. The forces are probably a little bit closer than they would be in an actual game, but that's just so they fit all on camera. One important thing to mention before we get started on the rules proper, is that throughout the entire video rulebook series, we'll often be referring to the Aperion Foundation player as Danielle, and the Karist Enclave player as Matt. That's just because it's easier to say Matt and Danielle than it is to say Karis player and Aperion player over and over again. In these next few videos, we'll be examining what the overall structure of a turn in Maelstrom's Edge looks like. Not so much the moving and the shooting of the models, but everything else besides that. Each turn is comprised of three phases, the command phase, the action phase, and the end phase. In this first video, we'll be focusing on the command phase. The command phase starts out with a role for priority which is both players rolling off against each other with the winner choosing who will be the priority player for the turn. Let's go ahead and roll a black die for the Aperians here. Daniel got a 3. And then for the Karists, Matt got a 5. So Matt won the roll for priority, but that actually doesn't automatically make him the priority player. Instead, he gets to choose who will be the priority player. Being the priority player means you always go first, whenever both players would act at the same time, including getting to activate the first unit of the turn. But it's not always a good thing to have the first activation, because sometimes you want to see what the opponent is going to do first, which means sometimes you want to give the priority player to the opponent. Which is exactly what Matt decides to do here. By giving priority over to Danielle, he makes her the priority player for the turn. After determining the priority player, the next thing is to generate command points. Command points are like a currency that players can use mainly to reduce suppression on their units, or to try to bring back destroyed units as a reinforcement. You generate a number of command points equal to the current turn. So on turn 1, you generate 1 command point, turn 2, 2 command points, and so on and so forth. Your command models also generate additional command points. So the journeyman bot handler for the Aperians generates 2 command points, and the Kadar Nova for the Karists also generates 2 command points. For our little example game, we're going to say that it's currently turn 2, which means both players are going to be earning 4 command points. We're also going to say that Matt had one command point left over from the previous turn. Plus generating four more gives him five total. Danielle also generates four of her own. These form a player's command point pool and aren't actually assigned onto models on the table just yet. Next up, it's time to declare reserves and reinforcements. You have the option to not deploy all of your units on the table at the start of the game. Instead, you can hold stuff in reserve and bring it on in any turn, including the very first turn if you want. But during the command phase of that turn, you have to declare which of your reserve units are going to be arriving onto the table that turn. If both players have reserves they want to bring on, then the priority player has to declare the reserves first. Also during this step, if either player wants to try to bring back one of their units that was previously destroyed as a reinforcement, they can also declare that as well. Note you can only try to bring back one unit per turn as a reinforcement, and you can only bring back any given unit once per game. So once a unit gets destroyed a second time, it can't come back. In our example game, we're saying that Matt has lost his Tempest Elites, a really powerful unit, in the first turn. Danielle focused everything she had at them and blew them off the table. Naturally, Matt really, really wants them back, while Danielle definitely doesn't want that to happen. The way you go about bringing back a reinforcement unit is by bidding command points for it. You secretly put a number of command points in your hand that you're willing to bid, while the opponent is going to try and stop you by secretly bidding command points of their own. Only the winning bidder actually gives up command points that they bid. The player trying to get the unit back has to beat the opposing player's bid, while the player trying to stop the reinforcement merely has to tie in order to win. In this case, Matt really wants to get his Tempest back, so he's going to secretly bid all five of his command points in his hand. Meanwhile, Danielle knows she can't stop him if he bids all of his command points, but she wants to make sure he pays the full price for them, so she's also going to bid all four of hers and they both reveal at the same time to find out that Matt bid 5, so he wins. All 5 of his command points are expended, and Danielle gets to keep her 4 command points. So although the Tempest will be coming back, she at least keeps some command points she'll be able to use to reduce suppression on her units. And the last step of the command phase is to allocate any command points that you have. So if you have any command points left over in your pool, you can allocate those onto models with a command ability that are on the table. In this case, Danielle has two command models, the Journeyman Bot Handler and the regular Apprentice Bot Handler. 
You can allocate a number of command points onto a model up to its willpower characteristic. Danielle puts three onto the journeyman and one onto the apprentice. The apprentice is only able to use it to reduce suppression on his own unit, but since they have two suppression, he'll be able to reduce one of those. The journeyman is able to affect a radius, so when other units nearby activate, he's able to use his command points to reduce their suppression, which will be useful for Danielle. And that's the end of the command phase. Thanks for watching, and make sure to check out our next video where we'll continue to break down the turn overview, this time focusing on the action phase.